Procter & Gamble stock is the topic of today's presentation. And if you're invested in PG stock, we happen to be investors in PG stock, then you'll want to watch this because it talks about uh, how strong this firm is, yet how vulnerable they are to mistakes. So this thumbnail image that you see here, Tide, that was put there for a reason. Tide happens to be the leading liquid laundry detergent brand in the United States. And that's by a wide margin there. You can see that right behind Tide is Gain. Well, those both happen to be Procter & Gamble brands. So they're dominating this niche, and that's reflected in this breakdown of their various segments. This is as granular as you're going to find a breakdown. You can see on the right, Fabric Care at the top there with 23% of Procter & Gamble's revenues coming from that segment, and then nearly half of those coming from North America. So the Tide franchise is very successful, and that comes down to having dominant market share. We always want to invest in leaders. So you might ask, well, how easy is it to compete with Procter & Gamble? It's not easy, but it's not impossible. So if you look across the globe, only 14 countries don't carry Procter & Gamble products. So if you're going to uh, compete with other firms, then you're likely going to find all kinds of competition abroad that you've never heard about here in the States. When it comes to their clients, Walmart's 15% of Procter & Gamble's sales with no other company accounting for more than 10% of total revenues. They likely have a very strong relationship with Walmart along with their top 10 customers who account for 40% of sales. Now, Even though Procter & Gamble seems very entrenched, it's possible to steal market share. So one company in particular uh, took just five years from being founded to being acquired by a billion dollars by Procter & Gamble's competitor, Unilever. Any guesses as to what firm that might be? Well, it's this firm, the Dollar Shave Club. And if you haven't seen this commercial, it's absolutely phenomenal. You can just look on YouTube for Our Blades Are Effing Great, and this will pop up. And it was very well done. It was viral. It had all the elements of a great marketing message. And it worked quite well in accelerating the brand equity of Dollar Shave Club so they could be purchased. Now, when we look at cross Procter & Gamble's different segments. This is at a higher level. You see five segments here. Grooming, what Gillette falls under, is just 8% of their net sales last year and 10% of earnings. So that's the beauty of the Procter & Gamble business is that even though one of their segments can be attacked, they still have a, a very diverse consumer product portfolio. I've highlighted some of their major brands here, Head & Shoulders, Old Spice, Gillette, Crest, Vicks, Tide, Pampers. We all know these brands because they have such dominant market share. And that's what success means for Procter & Gamble. And it's what we look for when we invest in companies. We want market leaders. Here you can see just some metrics on their brands. The global blades and razors market share they have is more than 60%. That's down over the past decade, but still pretty strong. Male electric shavers market 25%, 50% of the female epilators market, um, number two market share position with nearly 20% global market share for Crest and Oral-B. And you can read down the list here, 40% for bounty paper tiles. That's incredible. Those aren't cheap relative to substitutes, 25% for Charmin. So, Procter & Gamble's done a great job of building these brands, and when they sabotage themselves, it's very concerning for investors. That brings us to the Pound Me Too movement, which was about four years ago, and uh, probably the only thing worth mentioning about this is that where it should have become a concern for everyone was when uh, individuals started becoming guilty by uh, accusation on social media. That's a big concern. If you want to live in Mao's China, that's fine, but uh, I certainly don't. So uh, when it comes to investing, at least, this article from Forbes really spelled it out. Politically charged language should always be avoided by advertisers. So attacking your client base and the use of the term toxic masculinity in this ad was a big mistake. This was seen by many as a one-sided critique and stereotype of an entire gender. It's as, as if they said that women enjoy shopping and they're quite emotional. You can't attack a gender because it doesn't look good. And this resulted in quite the backlash. I remember seeing 
when this ad came out, just how strong that was. And of course, Procter and Gamble and the media in general tried to underplay that, but it was very obvious to anybody watching. Alienating a substantial portion of your target audience is never a good thing. And Michael Jordan once said, Republicans buy shoes too. That's wise thinking. You don't want to get in politics Uh, Whatever country you're operating in, it's simply bad marketing practice to offend a significant number of your own customers. And we had some real concerns around whether or not this would persist with Procter & Gamble's brands where they would uh, be alienating customers. Well, we looked at the person responsible for this, this individual here, one of their top executives that was overseeing the company's gender equality initiatives. She told CNN, we have a responsibility and an opportunity to use our voice. It's not about lecturing people. Yes, yes, it is. She says, it's not about telling people how to think. Yes, it was. That's exactly what you were doing. Fortunately, this imbecile retired a year ago. So we're hoping that we won't see any more of this. And when you look at the impact that had, Procter & Gamble tried to underplay this, as did the media, but it was very obvious this gentleman here did uh, some research on it so we didn't have to. You can see that drop there, a meaningful drop in market share as a result of that ad. And since then, Procter & Gamble has said they're shifting the spotlight from social issues, great, to local heroes, excellent, like firefighters and personal trainers. Well, I don't know how much of a local hero a personal trainer is, but that's better than getting into social issues. And the new ads they're going to be running, it says, come in the wake of months-long backlash against their Me Too-inspired We Believe campaign, along with an $8 billion non-cash write-down by P&G for the shaving giant. So this, uh, of course, in summer of 2019, Procter & Gamble writes down Gillette business but remains confident in its future. And, of course, they wouldn't want to mention that ad Uh, They wrote down the value about $8 billion, blamed it on currency devaluations and lower shaving frequency, uh, along with, of course, this is valid, increased competition from disruptors like Dollar Shave Club and Henry's, but those didn't just come out. They had been around for a while. And here's where we start to get angry about this is when it starts to affect our income. So we rely on these firms as many investors do for income, and you can see the impact that had on their payout ratio when they had that write down and what that did there. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But when it comes to future write downs, Procter & Gamble paid $57 billion in 2005 for Gillette, world's number one shaving brand that's more than a century old. So damaging that franchise wasn't a very good idea. When you look at their balance sheet, you see carrying value for that brand, most recently of $14.1 billion dollars in uh, goodwill and intangible. So uh, they said here just recently that um, no triggering event has occurred, but uh, the Gillette intangible asset is most susceptible to future impairment risk. As I said, they're still holding 60% market share. So hopefully they learned their lesson and they won't be dabbling in politics in a politically charged country like America anymore. Now, when we look at the top consumer staples stocks out there. The reason that this topic came up is that we're putting together a list of the 10 best dividend growth stocks for investors. That's part of the Nanalyze new money portfolio that we're building. And at the top of the list here, when it comes to consumer staples, there are a lot more than three names, but I pulled the the top three names here so that you can see you have Procter & Gamble, Coke, and Pepsi. P&G sits at the top there, uh, a remarkable track record, increasing dividends for over 60 years. It's a very large firm market cap, over $300 billion, a decent yield. What we're most interested in as dividend growth investors is the likelihood they can continue that track record going forward. And that's what's referred to as a payout ratio. Here's a very simple example. On the left, you can see the estimate of earnings per share and the actual in light blue. So they're roughly the same. But compare that then to the numbers on the right. So if we just take Q3 2023, we see that they had $1.37 in actual earnings per share. Of that, they paid out $0.94. Cents. So, and you can see that last increase, that's fairly small. So what will happen is when they start getting earnings per share too close to their dividend, they decrease the percentage that 
their increasing of the dividend, and that's so that they can continue maintaining that increase over time. So that's all reflected in our quantigence strategy, which you saw on that previous slide, where we look at those seven factors like yield, payout ratio, and growth. Now, when it comes to yield, a lot of investors will say, well, Procter & Gamble just doesn't have a high enough yield. I want to see Procter & Gamble at 4% before I would buy it. Well, you won't see that happen very often. This chart from The Motley Fool shows the yield of Procter & Gamble over time, and that's uh, you would be good to buy it at a yield, let's say, of uh, 3% or higher, but you won't likely see 4%. So this remains a very strong stock in our portfolio. We believe one of the strongest uh, consumer staples dividend growth stocks out there. That's because they have some extremely strong global brand franchises. Consumer goods, they're purchased in good times and bad. Now, PNG's decision to take a political stance whenever they do that needs to be consistently condemned. And we're going to continue listing this as a risk in our report so people are aware of what happens when you purposefully damage a brand. However, going forward, it seems that uh, PNG uh, keeps its uh, dominance in the consumer staples sector as one of the top dividend champions in our entire universe. Now, I'm going to put up another video here that you might want to watch. Before you watch that, please click the Nanalyze logo on the right. Subscribe to our channel. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this today.